Okay, so first of all, I'd like to note that both panels of the symposium um, enlarge the terrain of reproduction, so that besides the womb, the egg, and the period of pregnancy, we might also focus in extreme close-up on the control over meiosis and mitosis. Oh, actually, I'm going to put up the... I'm just going to put up the, the, um, the slide, just for a second, it's the one visual. Anyway, the program, you don't actually have to look at anything up here, but um, the program, the photo is actually of mitosis, in fact. Um, so we might also focus in extreme close-up on the control over meiosis and mitosis, or on cellular metabolism and regulation, or to continue the cinematic metaphor, our speakers also vocalize via long shot on zones of interaction and relationality that, while superficially seeming far afield from reproductive concerns, remain central to them. So, geopolitical differences and clinical practices, this is Jean's paper, sort of giving you a little tantalizing allusion to what's coming in our next panel. The ec economic calculus of drug development, um, that's my first paper, and the interdependence of human communities and environment. That actually speaks to a lot of our panels today. Uh, these papers push us to ask how traditional historical feminist concerns regarding women's bodies, racial stratification and reproductive politics, and caretaking labor have transformed the disciplinary archive of science and technology studies, the legal and philosophical adjudication of life's beginnings and ends, or played a part in projecting a vitalism to the non-zoological aspects of the chemical and mineral world as asserted by the new materialists, as Susan pointed out, and scholars drawn from environmental studies. Richly complex in the frameworks, the papers on this first panel urge consideration of elements of time, as in past acts sedimented in human bodies, whether by way of surgical procedure, as in the famous uh, film, or the seepage of chemical influence, effluence, um, as, in, as, in, as in the work that Murphy's studying. Um, these sedimented uh, past that are not necessarily visible or may easily manifest in the language of visual certainty. Um, they also have us consider the looped and looping relation of feminism's presence to feminism's past, again, um, Squire's work, and she might elaborate a little bit more on that framework later. Uh, the desire to track what makes us modern, for instance, um, the notion of Zoe's entrance into the political at marking the moment of modernity, or what aporia, such as the Homer Sasser, uh, trans temporally lingers on the border of sacred role and political role, and those zones of non ruled non-regulated, unruly, or imperceptible, um, or imperceptibility that we relentlessly wish to bring into perceptibility. Uh, uh, time is also a preoccupation in the idea of hauntings of the past, or future than war, um, as the Jima Fang so eloquently put it. And then finally, um, we have less linear ways of, con of uh, conceiving of time suggested in our panel in the afternoon, um, such as periodicities of food intake um, in Hannah Landecker's work, and the synchrony of food and sleep-wake cycles. So different notions of temporality, rhythmic notions of temporality will come in in the second panel today. The other big uh, common concern of at least the papers in the first panel, I think, is um, either explicitly or implicitly this notion of affect, okay? And this comes up in Susan Squire's paper specifically, so I'll, I'll uh, press her more on that in a second, but affect has a kind of corollary aesthetically or in art practices to mood. Um, and in terms of environment, we might think about affect's corollary as a contaminant, as non the non separability of humans and the atmosphere whether registered as sensation, feeling, emotion, or mood. So um, I'm going to continue with that as I talk now about each individual paper and pose individual questions. And again, for those of you who missed the opening remarks, the desire here is for the audience to be part, active participants in the discussion. So I'll also open it up to the floor. OK, so Susan Square reminds us that second, um, perhaps the third wave feminism, while heavily steeped in Marxist socialist psychoanalytic as well as liberal civil rights based approaches, um, later challenged by intersectional and queer approaches, had at best an indifferent, even possibly phobic attitude towards science and technology. But not for a simple lack of women being present, even if as token, in the heady transdisciplinary colloquia on epigenetics and cybernetics. In a feminist vein, 
Squire remembers for us Marjorie Green as a female or feminist, and there's a little slippage there I'd like you to talk about, um, STS scholar, contemporary with Washington, whose pregnant world egg metaphor unsettled him from the mathematical computational modus operandi of biology dominant at the time, but failed to move him, Squire implies, from the functionalist themes sedimented as the field's techno-scientific habit. Was it Marjorie Greene's femaleness or her feminism that led her to urge a non-functionalist, non-instrumental approach to living materials? Or was it her philosophy, uh, philosophical onto-epistemological affiliations, or her praxis of armed husbandry? Squire Cannelly and I would suggest, theoretically suggest, that it doesn't matter how we reconstruct the origins of women's challenge to this functionalism. That indeed, such disaggregating of her femaleness biology, from her feminism, her culture, from her farm work, her praxis, this speaks a purification technique that Latour reminds us is the mystified hallmark of modernity. modernity. Instead, Squire richly narrates the co-assembled events, the consequence of a zoological and philosophical transdisciplinary training, an invite to a 1967 Sir, Sir Baloney uh, symposium, and a sustained dwelling on a working farm rather than a primary dwelling in a research lab that contingently gave rise to Green's notion of invariant invariance and vorticism. You skipped over this entirely in your talk, but um, it, I give you the opportunity to elaborate on that. I wondered if invariants were kind of canalized abilities like the genomes that we think of, and affordances were more like the random cascades out of prior pattern contingencies of genomes interaction with environment that now we call epigenetics. But what I would really like you to elaborate on more is the role of affect, both as an interrogatory critical tool that helps us understand the blind spot of Blindington, and secondly, as a rhetorical device in this paper, which, again, I read a, a, a longer version of it. Um, so in the paper, affect um, vis-a-vis feminist theory, it comes in by way of the subtitle Love and Blame, rather than uncanniness. Um, so by highlighting Waddington's being unsettled or feeling an eerie uncanniness as a pretension of the world as pregnant, the biosphere as an egg, are you suggesting the operation of or the central quality of affect is something like Murphy latency, a quality rather than a temporal period of embodied knowing, of tactily registering chemical biological transformation uh, that remain unintelligible on the expressive augmented or or are you more interested in the shutting down of that effective disposition, whether by way of Waddington's returning to laboratory evidence as more authoritative than Gnostic philosophy, or by way of those peculiar relational ethics of love and blame that seem to haunt them in this colloquy? Um, you speak of Waddington as a polymath, and I view this paper as using a polymath method, but one that draws not just from biochemical, philosophical, spiritual research, but also considers political affective bonds and allegiances as, um, as materials we need careful study. Uh, Squire's allusion to affect, of course, syncopates with Murphy's paper, um, and uh, the affects that Mur Murphy and others are implicitly, implicitly, if not explicitly, critiquing with regard to generativity, pregnancy, or promissory futures that are sort of forward-moving. Um, and I'm going to return to that uh, a little bit later, but I just wanted to mark it down. I'm also curious about the study of the status of the comic. Now again, this was completely and entirely left out, which is too bad, because in this essay, <laughs> um, Squire talks about subservient chicken, which is just fantastic. I have not seen it, but this viral out on the internet. Um, so the comic comes in by way of subservient chicken, but also by way of a joke. Right, with, with, with which Waddington dismisses Green. Squire reminds us that subservient chicken lured with the promise of absolute control over the chicken. This would command it, would do what she commanded. Even while behind the scenes, marketing gurus were using the viral ad as a grand experiment to gather intel on site visitors to control them. A kind of ironic reversal structures the tale of subservient chicken. The desire not only to control the poultry that lays the golden egg, that is the promissory potential of what Bridges examines as Zoe. By, by simple type directives, um, which is also then the promissory potential of logocentrism. Hmm. Um, and yet, if the finger wagging pop-up to the input of pornographic command, com commands was central to 
some sort of interest in chicken for revival. So if you asked it to do a naughty thing, instead of doing it, there would be like, mm -hmm, right? Mm -hmm. So um, it would seem not, um, it would seem that it's not control satisfied, but control thwarted, or put it away, put it under way, the limits of subservience, that's that subservient chicken, made, that made subservient chicken the sensation it was. That is, the ad campaign extracts value from numerous deflated, um, uh, as shared laughter, the henny penny, henny penny mockery uh, uh, of our limited control. And you talked about uh, bringing, I think this is you, you use the phrase, the chastening of our mastery. And I've been thinking about that, about that in, in the register of the comedic. Uh, finally, while we might have thought openness, hostility to the strange and unsettling, you know, that, that you suggested that Wadden goes down, as that which potentially undermines our various centri centrisms, we ought also to, to be wary of when that effective disposition transmutes into one of fetishizing the promissory or virtual over the lived and real. And this brings me to Bridges' paper. Bridges, following uh, Didier Hassan and others, somewhat counterintuitively, uh, so, so, uh, sorry, Hassan and others somewhat counterintuitive premise that Zoe, their biological life, is now our most sacred form of protected life. Mere life, rather than life conforming to a particular political path, for instance, one holding democratic capitalist ideolo ideology rather than a communist socialist feminist one, becomes the state's concern, right? So human rights rather than progress of the free world becomes the authenticating rationale for asylum, for foreign policy, for military mobilization. As suggested by Bridges, the Thebes makes fleshly and concrete the rather amorphous idea of life, in quotes. It is by way of court decisions regarding the Thebes, from Roe to Casey to Carhart, that we might track the state's increasing political interests or claims over Zoe. Uh, I couldn't help, however, thinking the Thebes besides the embryonic stem cell as a figure of Zoe par excellence, and this is very much indebted to Wendy Cooper's work. Both represent a kind of abstract theory of potentiality, a vitality that has not taken a specific lived shape, uh, like prior to or suspended from its race, class, and sexual trajectories, and thereby, or because of that suspension, figuring as the protected bio value of both pro life legislation and a fetish object of promissory finance capital. In Kluger's work, is the embryonic stem cell, not the fetus, that becomes iconic of certain potent futures, or to use Bridges' phrasing, materializing the building. So counterintuitively, Bridges suggests that Carhartt unintentionally frames the 22 to 24 week old fetus as lives that can be killed, albeit only in certain ways, that is, via dilation and extraction, or in juice later, but not intact dilation and extraction. Thereby, and here I'm sort of extrapolating, rendering clinicians the keepers of these neo-religious sacrificial techniques. The force of ruling, in other words, is to turn the social theater into divine or religious rather than secular space. And I, I don't know what to do with that rather than just mention it. Um, I'm most interested in the ambition of this project, the combining of legal anthropology and ethnographic interviews. And I'm curious about how you will conduct these ethnographies. Uh, will you follow pregnant women longitudinally over the course of a pregnancy and then through the first year of their offspring infancy uh, for those who carry their pregnancy to term? Will you interview two different sets of women, one group pregnant at the time of their field work and another group of children, let's say at voting age, um, asking those women to reflect on their relations to their children when they pull out or in utero in comparison to the regard for their offspring as formed social and political beings as they enter at least political adulthood? Also, to what extent will you entertain pregnancy as a time when pregnant women realize intensely their own zoe, or both biological embodiment, uh, similar to how the body becomes phenom phenomenologically present to us when incapacitated or ill, so that the fetus, while perhaps a focal point of visualized um, zoe, um, as in uh, you know what medical practice gives us <clears throat> biological anim anim animateness might also be um, so only as an extension of pregnant women's realizing their own intensified sense of biological contouring, um, but at a time in the life cycle when they are considered politically and reproductively mature, that is a bias. So I'm, I'm basically using your, your terms here. Uh, I wonder too if by Zoe, especially in the hypothesis that one would assume that the birth of the fetus diminishes life, or Zoe as the birth of the child is the beginning of bios, and that's a quote from 
the section on chapter six, Zoe acts as a synonym for promissory vitality yet to be. The abstracting of promise from promise, the financialization of the promissory, turns us to the entwined subjects of temporality and value. Very much the focal point of Murphy's work. So Murphy provocatively redefines the temporal and locational scale of reproduction on how bodies are situated in relation to chemical infrastructures slowly incubate, um, incubate endocrine disruptors, the effects of which may not necessarily be seen across an individual lifetime, but, but intergenerationally. Most admirable about Murphy's work is his exemplary assemblagist mode of bringing together post-colonial science and technology studies and femiqueer theory, um, as well as its emphasis on the bodies as temporal archives. Um, so again, the element of time becomes key here with, uh, with Murphy using, uh, making legible to us through this term latency, the temporal that um, connecting or narrowing the not necessarily linear effects of chemical infrastructure on animal biology. Um, okay, so now, while latency, so now I'm actually, I have several questions about latency, okay? On the one hand, I got the sense that latency was in a way of naming the infrastructural scale of, of chemical slow violence, okay? And that one of the points was to sort of connect across the temporal gap of stimulus, as you said, and effects. Um, on, on the other hand, and this kind of rose out of our conversations over the past day, I was wondering if latency may be sort of the negative space of the promissory, right? Um, and if so, you know, how does that work with regard to latency the other way? And I also wanted to press Murphy on the question of politics, with which, with which he left us at the very end of the paper. So, paying attention to, to latency, is it instrumental for the forging of better regulatory policy vis-a-vis -vis chemical infrastructures and environmental effects? Is that how you see it? Is that the normal position of your paper? Or is latency more of a deconstructive tool recognizing the limits of our knowledge of the lag between contamination or, less pejoratively, alteration and perfection. Um, I was quite drawn to, but also wanted to make more concrete your statement that there is no inherent ethics to either generativity or difference, but only political determinations on how those qualities or dispositions work in local contexts. That is, if we were on the side of generativity, we might find ourselves lamenting the, the changed sex ratios among the amjunam, Boys birth at an anemic 35% as a clear sign of chemical injury. But also in doing so, unwittingly we are aligned with promissory reproductive narratives that preserve heterosexual reproduction and binary sex as an unquestionable good. And Nathan Ha is, is also she credited for this line of questioning as well since he brought this up yesterday. If we are on the side of difference, we might regard with more equanimity um, the proliferations of transsexual biological life or alterations to sex ratios that materialize a queer future, but also find ourselves oddly unsympathetic to whether the bucket testing and community health charts of the Andronon constitute evidence of chemical injury in a certain fashion, meaning policy changes in the short term. So I'd like us as a group to discuss what Murphy's provocative observations mean for from a queer politics and indigenous or post-colonial medical politics. Or put it differently, do we long for a clear enemy um, and clear unequivocal injury, as in you know, cancer, so that our politics can be easy, right? So they politics, you don't have to figure out what the politics are. You just say, I'm against cancer. Right? Um, but as Cooper in Life um, as Surplus outlines, and as the science fiction writer Octavia Butler speculated as well, the quality of cancer cells pro proliferate is a form of generativity. Um, and Cooper goes on to suggest that when conducted by the embryonic stem cell, this proliferant, quasi-cancerous, replicative behavior is fetishized and financialized. Citing Soto and uh, Sunshine, Murphy notes that, hardly apparent, this prolific, prol proliferant characteristic associated for us with cancer is actually character characterizes all metazoan cells and is only made latent by cytoplasm inhibitors. <laughs> um, our cellular cytoplasm, in other words, engages in a kind of daily prophylaxis or birth control that endocrine disruptors, perhaps chemical versions of the radical right, would take away. Um, okay. 
And finally, a little bit, maybe it's because I am reading the Morgolas, but the scenario presented to us is one in which mitosis, the doubling of cells, the replication of cells and tissues that happens all the time, that kind of generativity takes priority over meiosis. The having the chromosome materials to form, gametes of sex cells, that kind of sex generativity. <coughs> So if, sexual, if the sexual division of labor tied to women's mystified, mystified in actual relation to, to childbearing is still a reveling cry for sexual inequality, then mitotic generativity and the weighting of meiotic generativity in evolutionary adaption of selection would seem congruent and then it's pain. Food for thought. Okay. Akin to the idea of latency, uh, so back to latency, and akin to this idea of latency or perhaps the aesthetic corollary of latency and tempting of pain as stone, um, is the ambivalence of whiteness. Um, uh, for Tajima Pena, the uh, whiteness as bridal color, shroud, apparent blankness or absence, and <coughs> also as palpable racial infrastructure, edges or shots, blurs um, the aim, the desire for a fuller picture and thwarts desires for judicial restitution. Um, this whiteness is itself a, a palpable presence that kind of squeezes in around the edges of the film. Um, in terms of thwarting the desire for judicial restitution, um, I would note, I don't know if you noted this, but uh, I mean in the talk, that Madrigal uh, was decided not for the plaintiffs. In fact, the, in, in a sense, the plaintiffs did not get restitution uh, in the courts. And I was wondering about how the, that conclusion affected your choice of this as a subject for the film. Okay, so what would, if, if Madrigal had been decided the other way, would it have been as good a choice for the film? How would that have changed the aesthetic practice? Uh, let's see. So, um, so we can think about the violence of, of, uh, of what happened to the women that Tajina Pena documents in Mas Davis as reproductive health and pop population policy as sort of the agents of, of violence. But maybe we can also, and this is tying back into the theme of time, but maybe we can also think about the violence as um, the idea of a monolithic modernity or the idea that everyone has to be sort of synchronous in modernity um, as the structural violence. And here I'm thinking about um, uh, Lawrence Cohen's work and Susan Greenwell's work on population control and the phrase as if modern, right? So if one through education campaigns cannot convince people that you must have fewer children because of population control objectives or GNP directives, whatever they be, um, instead you operate, right? And you make someone as if that is surgically modern, right? So in line with population controls. And so I thought that that would be an interesting way to sort of connect to Jima's Pena's uh, concerns with time. Uh, time you thought about in terms of ghostly hauntings, but what can we think about the time or the violences of as a modernity as well? The film, as you um, uh, put, it, put it, transgressively appropriates pro-life iconography. Um, so for instance, the foreground of the girl riding the bicycle against the cemetery gravestone in the background. Might, might be considered um, in the same. But while perhaps pro-natalist in the fleeting, fleeting images of children, I wonder if saying that they are pro-life is painting the pic picture too starkly black and white, so to speak. When thinking of pro-life iconography, and I'm trying to hear with Bridget's paper, it is the fetus that has priority and not the um, unfertilized gametes, which are more properly protozoa, protozoa is protozoan. Again, an insight drawn from, drawn from Bridges, sort of the cross-contamination of the paper there. Uh, nor is uh, priority granted in pro-life iconography to bios, right? So this is again using uh, Bridges. That is postnatal life, postnatal lived life that is socially and politically specific, if not politically protected. And it is as bios that these young children are represented in specific public places in East Los Angeles. So one more final point uh, with regard to this film. And this sort of returns to Madrigal, Madrigal v. Hooligan and it be, being decided not for the plaintiffs. So in Wachitina's Residues of Justice, 
as well as the Lisa Lowe's Immigrant Acts. They both propose the cultural aesthetic arena as that which precisely houses the remainder of what cannot be resolved in the political judicial realm. Okay? The political judicial realm cannot give us that balanced portrait that we think of as justice. So instead, those remainders are wrapped in the aesthetic or cultural fields. So I kind of want to suggest that even if Madrigal versus Filligan have returned a verdict finding malfeasance on part of Edward James Filligan and County USC, this film would still need to be made. Right? A verdict in the plaintiff's favor would still not adequate or balance the grief of their non-voluntary cuttings and civilizations. Um, but I still want to know how it would change your practice had the decision gone the other way. Um, 